Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, The Power of Multiplexing and Applications of the Quantigene Plex Assay in Oncology Research and Diagnostics. It is presented by Godfrey Greck, PhD. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific is a world leader in serving science, whose mission is to enable customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Thermo Fisher Scientific helps their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. For more information, please visit www.thermoscientific.com. I'm Judy O'Rourke of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. So before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or you can use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Greck, who is an associate professor at the University of Malta. He is responsible for the Molecular Pathology Research Laboratory and Director of Biotech Innovations, a spin-off company. The main research topic aims to identify biomarkers to classify breast cancer patients into a specific therapeutic group, which will benefit from activation of phosphatases as a main therapeutic option. Dr. Greck has published more than 25 peer-reviewed publications, presented more than 50 conference papers, and published five book chapters. He is a member of the Molecular Pathology Working Group of the European Society of Pathology, an active member of the European Association of Preventive, Predictive, and Personalized Medicine, and a member of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative. Dr. Greck's complete bio is found on the LabRoots website. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Greck. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much. So um, uh, today I will be um, presenting the, the power of uh, multiplexing with the contagion plex assay. So first we're going through the technology. So the biomarker research I am about to present relied on the Quantigene Plex assay, which is a Luminex-based multiplex RNA assay. Luminex technology uses color-coded magnetic beads that can be conjugated with antibodies or oligonucleotides specific to particular bioassays, allowing users to multiplex several targets in the same way. Thermo Fisher Scientific supplies a variety of Luminex-based assays to measure RNA or DNA as well as protein. So the quanti Thermo Fisher's Luminex-based immunoassay is called the Procartaplex assay. With Procartaplex, you can quantitate up to 80 analytes in one sample using only 25 microliters of plasma or serum. There are several pre-designed panels available, such as immuno-oncology, or you can select analytes to configure your own mix and match panel. The Quantigen Plex assay uses branch DNA technology for signal amplification to measure gene expression probing RNA and DNA. Branch DNA uses sequential hybridization of oligonucleotides to a capture target RNA or DNA in order to amplify a signal for quantitative measurement. Thermo Fisher uses branch DNA in several platforms, as you can see on the slide, including gene expression, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and flow cytometry. Next, I'll show you how the branch DNA and the quantigene plex assay work in the diagram to the right. First, you add your sample to a bead mix 
that consist of both the magnetic luminate beads as well as a set of probes that are used to capture the target RNA. During the first incubation, the capture extenders hybridize to the capture probes conjugated to the beads, while also hybridizing to the target RNA sequence, as you can see in the diagram. This captures the target RNA onto the desired beads through a process called cooperative hybridization. Each bead cutter has its own target-specific set of probes, allowing multiple genes to be captured onto different beads. Also, hybridization to the target RNA are label extenders, which provide the basis for the branched DNA signal amplification structures. These label extenders are always designed in pairs to enhance the specificity of the assay. The third type of probe is the blocking probe, hybridizes to any piece of the target sequence that is not already targeted by the capture extenders or label probes. The purpose of the blocking probes is to form a complete double-stranded piece of RNA protecting it from RNAs and helping to prevent secondary structures within the target region. The capture extenders, label extenders, and blocking probes all comprise the target-specific probe set, designed and provided by Thermo Fisher. Next, the branched DNA oligonucleotides form the signal amplification structure. First, a pre-amplifier hybridizes to the labor label extender pairs. In the next incubation, many amplifiers hybridize to each pre-amplifier and in the following incubation, many label probes, oligonuclease, hybridize to each amplifier. The label probe molecule is conjugated with biotin, so when streptavidin phycoerythrin is added in the last step, a fluorescent signal is created and measured. So now I would like to introduce um, the work done with utilizing the quantigene assays in our laboratory. Our molecular pathology lab was established in 2008 under the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery Department of Pathology in the field of oncology research. We have been using the quantigene plex assay since 2012, mainly in multiplex format using the Luminex platform. Experiments ranged from cytokine assays, transcription profile assays, and gene expression, measurements from various sources, including cell lines, flesh tissue, and formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue, which I will refer to in this presentation as FFPE. Today, I shall be focusing on the use of the multiplex assay to classify breast cancer patients, providing evidence of the strength of the quantigen plex assays to find new potential subtypes. Our group studies the phosphatase complex, protein phosphatase 2A, mainly focusing on its role in the deregulation of cancer. We gained experience in utilizing minute amount of tissue material to measure known and novel biomarkers using quantigen plex panels. Just a brief introduction of the group and also to understand the facilities available. So starting from left to right at the back, standing up, there is Dr. Romina Briffa working on the colorectal cancer um, research together with St. Andrews in Scotland. Professor Christian Sherry, which is the clinical research lead in our group. Maria Pia Christi, a PhD student working on basic research on the complex. That's myself. Then there's Dr. Sean Baldacchino, who is um, performing most the QG and the quantity gene assays, and also the tissue microarray um, experiments in the, within the ACT project. In front, in, in the left, we see Christian Saliba, who is also 
an expert in quantigene assays and laser microdissection facilities. And Janice Sherry is a PG student working on HER2 resistance and she's working on liquid biopsies. Our commitment is to subtype patients into specific therapeutic groups that can benefit from PP2A activating therapy. The main objectives are to derive novel biomarkers defining these therapeutic groups and adapt our technologies to measure and set up predictive indicators. As I said, the postdoctor follows with ample experience in quantity plex assay. Um, Dr. Saliba and Dr. Bertokino are, are those that have the most of the work presented today um, in this webinar. I appreciate also the constant support from the clinical consultants at Mother Day Hospital. Professor Sherry is the clinical lead in our group. Dr. De Gaetano is the consultant histopathology and also the surgery department headed by Dr. Joseph De Bono. We run various research projects that make use of the quantigen plex assay, ranging from basic research, where we study the biology of the PP2A complex, to translational projects that involve novel biomarker discovery and validation. The extent of use of the technology spreads across different types of tumors. We work on breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lately, we also started cervical cancer with the HPV transforming events. And we also work across different types of sources, including cell lines, FFPE material, and liquid biopsies, all of which would require specific selection of normalizing genes and adaptation of the algorithms required to provide the accurate results. Various achievements were possible using the Essay, including the characterization of two novel biomarkers that provide information on the activity level of the pp 2 complex. And in fact, this year we actually filed a patent on these novel biomarkers. These biomarkers, we call them PABs during this webinar, PAB would stand for PP2A activity biomarkers. Now, a little bit of introduction on the Phosphatase, which is the PP2A complex, it, is con it consists of three subunits, the structural subunit A, the, car the catalytic subunit C, and the regulatory subunit B. There are over 40 different regulatory subunits, which can be grouped into activating regulators and inhibiting regulators. Our work and that of others have shown the association of differential expression of the inhibitory regulators of the PP2A complex with cancer aggressiveness and development. The complexity and therapeutic options are actually summarized in a review published in Tumor Biology that is indicated in the slide. Multiplexing and high throughput analysis from minute sample size is the key to investigate these complexes in patient material. So RNA-based assay using the quantigen plex was optimized in our lab with the goal to identify novel subtypes of patients that can benefit from PP2A activating therapies. This cartoon shows one of the actions of this phosphatase complex, namely the attenuation of the AKT mTOR pathway. The AKT mTOR pathway is an important pathway which activates survival and proliferation, and the PP2A complex um, would dephosphorylate this target and therefore attenuate this signaling cascade. On the right hand side, there is a box with red um, um, boxes. This is, these are the PP2A regulators which have an inhibitory function on the complex. Of note, we will mention CYP2A in our webinar. Expression level of these core complex subunits and the regulatory subunits is very informative, and we have done ex expression analysis on cellular models and patient material. The numerous permutation to derive a solid understanding of the activity of the enzyme is very complex, so we investigated novel biomarkers associated with enzyme activity and sensitivity.
two QPTOA activators. To translate our findings from basic research into the clinic, we use quantigen plux assay to measure gene expression in archival material that are well annotated with routine pathology results and clinical information. We decided to use cohorts that have at least five years of clinical information to derive overall survival and disease-free progression graphs. Following marking of archival material, two FFPE slides were prepared and two cores were taken from each sample representing the same tumor area. One of the cores was used to produce a tissue microarray, which I will be referring to it as TMA, and the other core homogenized for the quantigen assay. In the case of breast cancer, we repeated also the expression of estrogen receptor within the panels to correlate with the diagnostic annotations. This slide gives an overview of our approach to translate research within breast, the breast and colorectal cancer research areas. The workflow to classify breast cancer samples at a molecular level includes staining whole sections with hematoxin and eosin stain, which I will refer to as an H and E tissue stain, followed by specific immunohistochemistry staining, such as, you know, in this case, the estrogen receptor in breast cancer. A quantigene 40 plaque assay is used to measure gene expression of luminal basal markers, epithelium as in cayman markers, and expression of PP2A subunits and PP2A activity markers. The luminal basal markers used in this panel are well-known markers that are already published. The quantigene plex assay can be used to measure archival material that is more than 15 years old, and this provides the possibility to associate markers with clinical and therapy-related information. Immunohistochemistry was performed on the PP2A inhibitor regulators to correlate with the RNA-based results. This was done both on host section slides and lately tissue microarrays were used to increase the throughput. This slide shows the IHC results of samples that are positive to the cancerous inhibitor of PP2A, which is the inhibitory regulator called CYP2A. On the left, and the samples are negative for CYP2A on the right panel. Each case set represents a different receptor status of breast cancer patients, namely ER positive, HER2 positive, and triple negative, which I can call these TMBCs, and triple positive cases. Scoring for different antibodies is difficult to standardize, with different scoring methods selected for different markers, and also the subjectivity of scores require extensive training to achieve concordance between scorers. Hence, it is difficult to obtain a value that gives an objective measure of the complex activity using the immunohistochemistry stains. Of course, one has to appreciate the time required to score all the samples for multiple markers and derive a weighted value that can associate with the parameter being assessed, in this case, the activity of PP2A enzyme. To enhance the throughput, we assess the PP2A regulators and phosphotargets in breast cancer cohorts using tissue microarrays, TMAs. The phosphorylation status of the AKT and S6K, which are shown on the far left of the panels, is expected to reflect the PP2A activity or signaling activation, as shown in the cartoon before. Here, I am showing two distinct representative cases, showing low expression across PP2A inhibitors, and as expected, this is associated with the efficient PP2A dependent attenuation of the mTOR phospho targets AKT and the 6 kinase. The opposite is seen in the case below, showing an increased expression of PP2A regulator inhibitors 
accompanied by increased expression of AKT and S6 kinase. To conclude the IHC study, the immunohistochemistry study, we have shown that correlations using scores is limiting, subjective, and very time-consuming. Quantigene RNA plex assay provide us with a robust method generating quantitative values. Optimization requires the selection of the appropriate normalizing genes and the proper controls in the multiplex assay, preferably markers that can be compared with known results from first-line diagnosis done in routine pathology. This slide show the, shows the quantigene plex workflow using laser microdissection. So in laser microdissection, a specific part of the tissue is dissected using a laser, um, and this is selected depending on the, the immunostaining or the HND stain. Following that, tissue is homogenized and used directly into the DSA. This is one of the main advantages of the quantigene assay, since there is no need for RNA extraction, cDNA synthesis, and target amplification. In fact, as we've seen in the first slide, the probes will bind directly to the RNA target and then form a scaffold in, on which the actual signal is amplified. So the workflow is sample preparation, direct homogenization into the well target hybridization and signal amplification, as we've seen in the first slide. Following that, the multiplex is uh, detected using the Luminex technology. The quantigene fortiplex assay that we used in these studies was designed to simultaneously measure expression of 30 genes using FFPE material. To classify breast cancer, eight based in luminal classifiers and six epithelium mesenchymal markers were used. The PP2A complex was represented by the catalytic subunit and eight regulatory subunits, of which four are inhibitory. Eight potential PP2A activity biomarkers were generated from the basic research work and included in the panel. In addition, 10 normalizing genes were used to allow selection of the best normalizing genes and to optimize the assay. First, we looked at interrun variability using SL line RNA. A regression coefficient of 0.99 was obtained in various interrun variability assays and hence there is no significant difference between the replicates. Serial whole sections were homogenized with or without H and D stain, and the assay showed that there is no significant effect of the staining. This is very important uh, observation since the quantigene plex assay can be performed on stained material and proved to be useful to do laser microdissection in which tumors can be tumor tumor areas can be microdissected in a in a different tube from normal tissue from the same section. Optimizing the assay and developing an algorithm to classify patients correctly require training sets. First, we utilized the in silico data sets available, the Cancer Genome Atlas Breast Cancer RNA-Sec data, to annotate cohorts with the PAM50 molecular classification of luminal and basal. Once annotated, we used the RNA-Sec data available to predict the classification using the panel of genes in our assays. Data normalization was done using combinations of the normalizing genes in our designed panel. After normalization, we performed the prediction using our classifiers and compared that to the annotated pen 50 samples. This was done using a PCA plot. Following that, 
we integrated our quantigene RNA expression data within the same algorithm. The graph on the right shows a principal component analysis, PCA, showing luminal samples in blue, basal samples in red, and HER2 enriched samples in green. This was done using the classifiers in our panel and compared these to the annotations using the PAM50 classification. The table on the left shows that using the TCGA data, the classifier and classifiers in our panel result in 98.2% concordance with the PAM50 in total, 99.4% of ER positive cases using immunohistochemistry were classified as luminic cases and 95% of the TMPC cases classified as basal as expected. This slide shows that the eight genes used in our panel can provide an excellent luminal basal classification. So we tested and trained the algorithm using the TCGA dataset. This slide shows the first quantigenplex assay run using FFPE material from our patient cohort. Interestingly, there is 100% concordance with HER2 enrichment when comparing our results with the immunohistochemistry chemistry and FISH results. 96.8% of ER positives are luminal and 100% of the TMBC were classified as basal. This shows that the quantigene flex assay performs well on the aforementioned formula fixed perfume embedded material. Next, we looked at the normalized intensity values distribution among the different receptor status groups in breast cancer, namely the ER, HER2, and TMBC, triple negative breast cancer. The sample used are homogenized host sections from FFPE material. Growing left from right in each group, the first three genes represent the basin markers, the other five genes represent the luminal markers. The last marker on the right, in gray, shows expression of the estrogen receptor. As expected, estrogen receptor is expressed only in the ER positive groups, as shown in the red arrow. Expression of luminal markers is highest in the ER positive group, and expression of basal markers is highest in the TMBC, providing confidence in the results obtained. Of interest, in one particular case during this run, a TMBC case characterized by high expression level of basal markers also showed high expression of luminal markers. Given that the measurements were done using whole sections, we investigated the tumor section and identified using HND stain two potential tumor sites. Having the possibility of staining the slides for the quantigene plex assay analysis, we microdissected the identified abnormal sites and the RAND multiplex assay. The samples showed luminal properties and results indicated that there was also a difference in the mesenchymal marker expression. Hence, the quantigene plex assay was sensitive enough to pick up a heterogeneous sample and proved to be useful to analyze low input material from laser microdissection technology. The data of this particular case, the data is currently being reviewed for publication, and this shows the facility of the laser spectrum. As you all know, first-line diagnosis is done on biopsy samples. Contagene on whole sections actually identified heterogeneous samples, giving an interesting observation that resected samples might, one might check for heterogeneity using these kind of its assays. So achieving a good molecular classification in breast cancer provided the means to investigate further the novel PP2A activity in biomarker, the PABs. Of course, all this data was generated in only one run of the multiplex using the Luminex platform. 
Using breast cancer signs, we investigated the PAB and correlated the expression with sensitivity to PP2A activators. PP2A activity can be measured in vitro by immunoprecipitation of the complex and measuring the phosphatase activity, as you can see in the graph. It is well known that the PP2A activity in the leukemic cell line K562 is very low due to high expression of SAT and hence it is used as a control in this experiment. The bar chart shows that whereas the ER-positive cell line MDAMB453 has a normal PP2A activity, the TNBC cell line MDMB231 has a low phosphatase activity comparable to K562. Cell viability assays were performed on breast cancer cell lines. The TNBC cell lines DMMB231, BT20, and HS578T, graph A, were sensitive to low dose FTY720, a PP2A activator. The IC50 was reached at 5 micromolar concentration. Graph B shows three TMBC cell lines that are not sensitive to the drug. The luminal ER or her two positive cell lines are also not sensitive to the drug as seen in graph D. Graph C shows two cell lines derived from normal epithelium and are also not sensitive to the drug. This represents a new potential therapeutic group. Sensitivity also correlated strongly with the expression of the PP2A inhibitory regulator CYP2A and with other two PP2A activation biomarkers. Their expression was decreased following 24 hours of FTY 720 addition. So with these assays, we identified PP2 activity biomarkers using breast cancer models, cell lines. We, we have predicted sensitivity to PP2 activators in cell lines, the PABs, and today we're working on various PP2A activators, FTY720, and other small molecule activating um, molecules, it's called SMAPs, and new subtypes of patients potentially sensitive to SMAPs is being currently conducted in our labs. So the robustness and easy workflow of Quantigene Plex assay allowed us to extend the research to colorectal cancer and also currently optimizing the assay to study biomarkers in liquid biopsies. Using liquid biopsies shall provide the means to measure tumor markers in cells, circulating tumor cells, or in cell components, such as exosomes in blood, to achieve better patient monitoring and to promote research into early diagnosis. In addition, we are now setting up the Quantigene assay to read these markers in various patient-derived xenograft models. This will allow us to perform in vivo experiments using small molecule activators of PP2A, and therefore we can correlate the biomarkers with in vivo sensitivity to these SMAPs. The challenges in translational research is the integration of the clinical, diagnostic, and therapeutic data and the availability of the required sample type to validate findings and provide sound clinical utility. Through the ACT project, which is financed by the Malta Council for Science and Technology, we are addressing these challenges and also, and also validating and commercializing the use of Quantigine Plex assay for molecular classification of breast cancer. As you can see, this, is, this slide shows an overview of the ACT project and the challenges are to, to provide the samples um, uh, which, um, like FFPE tissues, fresh samples for exosome isolations, fresh samples to do liquid biopsies. And the use of TMAs is very useful because um, you can uh, prepare a TMA and also having the lysates for the quantigene assays. 
in a systematic way. This work has been done through various collaborations we have both academic and industrial collaborations. Um, I would like to also thank the Institute of Molecular Medicine Leeds, which provided us with a um, lot of um, uh, TMAs from the Breast Cancer Collection. Um, we are jointly working with uh, St. Andrews University, Scotland, on the colorective cancer research. We just finished a breast cancer project called Imaginex with the University of Palermo and other partners in, the, in, in, in Sicily. And we are pleased to work on liquid biopsies with the University of Athens um, in Greece. Previous to all our work in, in, in solid tumors, we, we worked on leukemia research and we were working jointly with Erasmus Medical Center. And, of course, our technologies, we always discuss these with Austrian Institute of Technology, a very good collaborator. And we are moving on to Xenografts now with, the, uh, with Cambridge in, on the EuroPDX project. And working also with um, American institutions on the SMAPs, the small molecule activate, activators of PP2A. Of course, I would also like to thank our industrial partners for um, um, commercialization of, of particular panels that we have ongoing in the laboratory. Well, thank you, Dr. Greg, for that informative presentation. It is time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Greg, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the pre presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click on the Send button. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, so let's get started. Our first question is, did you encounter any issues with degraded RNA or RNA protein cross-linking in your FFPE samples? And if so, how did you overcome this? Okay, so RNA degradation and also modification of the RNA by the formaldehyde in the FFPE material is definitely a major challenge. Um, for technologies that, that, of course, require PCR amplification uh, of the target that would require RNA extraction and eventually cDNA synthesis. Of course, as, as I mentioned before, one of the major advantages of the quantigene assay is that actually the sample is homogenized, and then the lysate is, is put directly into the assay. This means that you don't need to do any PCR amplifications or RNA extractions because the branch DNA technology is based, is based on amplification of the signal rather than amplification of the of the target. Uh, of course, of course, lately through also the ACT project, we also did an experiment where we degraded RNA from a cell line using heat treatment over time. And uh, when, when, the treat, when the RNA is degraded with fragments less than 200 base pairs, we can also I, um, uh, quantify specific markers on, on that material, which means that we can actually um, read um, and quantify uh, material when RNA is degraded. How old are the FFPE blocks used, and what is the minimum amount of sample in the input? We, we, we work successful with archival FFPE samples in general. Um, uh, most of our work, would, we would use FFPEs uh, as old as 15 years. We can go back to 15 years. And actually, we don't use FFPE material, which is... Um, uh, is, uh, is it has to be about five to ten years old for sure. That's because this will give us the opportunity to have clinical and therapeutic data with it. Um, as I said, I mean the Quantigen Plex assay has an advantage that one can run the Plex on the minimum amount of material, but also, as I said before, also on degraded um, material. So archival samples can be used. 
Now, because we can use all this material, and you can go back to 15, 15 years, of course, we can, we can uh, sort of validate quickly predictive biomarkers, of course, as long as the therapy is constant and that the, the, uh, it is relevant to this predictive value that we would need uh, to study. How do you normalize the data, given you start from crude extract? Okay, so RNA samples, um, it, it is uh, uh, optimized in, in a normal way. So if you start with RNA sample, it's important to have the same uh, micrograms of RNA per sample, and we move on to normalize, normalize that data with normalizing genes across the samples. Of course, this all depends on the, on the experimental design for, for cell lines. But when using FFP material, that's not a, that is not as easy. Okay? First of all, it is important to start with similar amounts of tissues and keep um, all information which is relevant to the input sample so that you can refer to uh, if, if there is something, um, if your results are not, are not ag agreeing with what you expect, for instance. In case of whole sections, for instance, we derive area of cellularity from the digital images, and of course we know the thickness of the sections. In case of laser microdissection, that is easier because the micro microscope will give us the input area and also the thickness, we would know it beforehand. Um, although this information is important, I mean, the, all, assays, all assays should be optimized. In a way, the optimization would mean that you need to study well the normalizing genes that you would be used to normalize data with. And of course, these normalizing genes will be different for specific tissue types and also sample types. We, as a group, have developed a couple of algorithms to actually assess and select these best normalizing genes for these different assays and for different types of samples. Um, uh, that's basically, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work beforehand um, to actually norm, to have, have a good panel of normalizing genes. We don't use only one normalizing gene per, per panel, but in general we have at least five normalizing genes per run, and then we, we, we have an algorithm to actually normalize the data with that. It is very important that every experiment would have a control um, gene um, that you already have some information it, on. So, for example, in breast cancer, we always put the estrogen receptor because we know from routine pathology that the sample is ER positive or not. Um, so this is something that is important to put within the panels and therefore also depends on the design of the experiment. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Greck for his presentation. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. I want to advise that a poll question will appear on your screen. You may select your answer, then close the poll question by clicking on the X in the right corner. The question is, are you interested in learning more about multiplexing from a company representative? Thank you. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from Labroots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.